Hi, I'm Taxon Fernandez, and I'll be talking about cognitive behavioral therapy and pain management programs today. As we run through this talk, we'll be, talk we'll be going through the origin of cognitive behavioral therapy. Some of the pioneers of the field will try and understand their contributions and how CBT evolved. Uh, what is CBT and what is it aimed to achieve? We also look at who, why, and how might be suitable and who not to include in a CBT approach. We look at the role of the cognitive behavioral therapist and the team that runs the program, the different types of programs that may be considered, relevant tests, and the benefits and future prospects of CBT-based programs. When we talk about cogn cognitive-based therapies, um, there have been several contributors to um, the strategies that might be used to manage and model cognitive patterns. However, when we look at uh, the time when Ronald Melzack and Patrick Wall proposed the gate control theory. At the time, the predominant thinking was of a bottom-up control, the peripheries being sensitized and everything being carried up to the brain. Patrick Wall and Melzack supported a top-down control with descending inhibitory pathways being the predominant mechanism. In a way, they suggested some of the biological variables as well with the affective, emotional, and environmental factors being contributory to pain. And so it may be looked as a revolutionary thinking or suggestion at the time. When we look at the origins of CBT, uh, predominant studies were based on anxiety, depression, and phobias. The, the names that come to mind are Fordus and Turk, who are pioneers for evidence-based behavioral and cognitive-based therapy techniques to manage pain. We shall now run through the evolution of CBT. And if you look at this slide here, we've on the left we have the years um, from 1950 to 2010. And if you look at the early 50s, uh, Mora, Masselman, Bandura and Ross, they were all instrumental in learning and behavioral models, psychoanalytical learning predominantly at the time. Then came in WALP with a theory of reciprocal inhibition, systematic desensitization. Rackman supported the same and also supported the theories of fear avoidance at the time. Lethem and Philip in 1983 brought about the theory of fear avoidance. And this was again reinforced by Slade in 1987. When we look at the theories of operant condition, conditioning and acceptance and competence therapies. With operant conditioning, it was mainly Skinner. This was again in the early 50s. Hayes brought about his theories of uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. Much later, in the early 60s, Fordis brought about the theories of a fear avoidance of a little bit on graded exercise-based patterns, and this was supported by McCracken more recently on exercise-based strategies into management of chronic pain. When we look at biofeedback models, Jacobson in the early 30s started working on the hardware for EMG tools, and he devised div um, kits that were available to measure uh, muscle tension, electromyofeedback, and also proposed progressive relaxation strategies and published his highly popular book on progressive relaxation in 1929. Miller supported his theories on behaviors and biofeedback and relaxation. Budzinski and Stovia, much later in the early, late, late 60s and early 70s, worked on supporting these theories again. When we go into stress reduction and coping models, Lazarus and Folkman's name stands out. They were then supported by theories from Mason Baum. Ellis in the early 50s uh, and Beck much later contributed significantly to cognitive behavioral therapy and their role in management of chronic pain. The Beck depression inventory scale is widely used even today. Turk supported these theories in the late 80s, uh, again on cognitive based therapy. More recent uh, emphasis on mindfulness based therapies have gained um, a lot of importance. The origins of mindfulness based strategies lie in the Buddhist texts and ancient texts um, in several different parts of the world, predominantly in Asia. 
More recently, uh, Jean kabat has used it in stress reduction. An application of the same in several different fields has evolved since. So when we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, what exactly do we mean? It's an option for a patient to go through a process of self-evaluation and self-appraisal. The patient learns about their own maladaptive cognitions and behaviors and makes a sincere attempt or a guided attempt to restructure or remodel and make changes to his, be his or her behavior. There's an improved overall ability to cope with pain. The aim is to reduce a negative impact of pain on their life, to reduce emotional stress, enhance physical, physical activity, and return to predict productivity within the society and work. Um, when we talk about the targets for cognitive behavioral therapy, we would talk, divide them into cognitive factors and behavioral factors. In this case, the cognitive factors would be, as outlined here, positive attitudes and beliefs, poor coping styles or strategies, unrealistic expectations, and fear avoidance thinking. We may also think about catastrophic thinking, which can then be divided into ruminative thinking, magnification of a certain thought, and helplessness, or learned helplessness, which was a concept that was proposed in the early 80s. We also talk about the external locus of control, wherein the individual believes that their whole situation is related to external factors, such as fate and bad luck. Poor self-efficacy, um, this can be evaluated in detail by several different tools as well. We then talk about behavioral factors, and the behavioral factors in this case would include personal, domestic, sleep, marital, or healthcare, and medication usage. Note the model in this cartoon which suggests the changes that happen with a patient in chronic pain who then have fear, develop tension holding, muscle tension, and reduce their overall function. The aim of CBT would be to shift them from this model to another model where when they have pain they learn to relax, move the relevant muscles carefully with awareness, notice it, enjoy the movement despite being in a certain degree of pain, accept it and then move on with their life rather than being in a vicious cycle of pain. So when we talk about CBT um, which patients would actually be suitable for cognitive behavioral therapy programs? Would there be any exclusion criteria? We talk about orange flags, and orange flags in this case would be major personality disorders, substance abuse disorders, post-traumatic stress, high levels of distress, active psychosis, somatoform disorders, suicidal or homicidal ideation, uncontrolled depression or mood disorders, Ongoing litigation and compensation. Ongoing litigation and compensation has quite an interesting component to it. Patients, again, depending on secondary gain, may either respond to the program by certain degree of behavioral modification. However, outcomes can be questionable. What is the role of a cognitive behavioral therapist in the program? Well, I think the aim, aim of a cognitive behavioral therapist is to assist with self-recognition of maladaptive thoughts, reactions, and beliefs. They help identify and challenge these negative thoughts. They address guarding and avoidance behaviors and thereby guide the patient to develop skills that they can incorporate into their normal lifestyle. A process called shaping, which gradually increases the nature and a frequency of a certain action despite them being in pain, which almost relates to activity pacing. Graded exercise programs were spoken about as we discussed in the evolution of CBT in the early 80s and since then have gained prominence. Improving one's self-awareness through exercises such as mindfulness training, guidance in managing anxiety and stress, and improving sleep cycles and patterns. Cognitive behavioral therapists would also guide the patient in use of other social support systems, development of, acute, of coping strategies, and use of medication. The cognitive behavioral therapist would also provide guidance in reaching appropriate goals, so setting patient-specific goals, um, for example, cooking a meal, walking to the shop, 
these would be specific patient goals that they would help them achieve. As a consequence of this, they would help them also improve their self-confidence and self-efficacy. Progress is reviewed on a weekly to monthly basis. So CBT programs are usually delivered uh, by trained and experienced individuals who form a team that work together and support each other should there not be one member of the team, the others can take on their role and they combine together to allow physical, functional and educational competence of the program. The options to deliver a program may be an intensive versus a basic program, an inpatient versus an outpatient, a one-on-one -on -one program versus a group program and small numbers versus large numbers, how this depends on the available resources and members of the team. So the psychological components of a CBT program would include realistic goal setting, stress reduction using several different techniques such as whole body relaxation through meditation, hypnosis, diaphragmatic breathing techniques, targeted relaxation using muscle biofeedback techniques, cognitive restructuring, behavioral modification, and dealing with specific anxieties and mood issues. Again, we go into this little cartoon which shows us the cycle of pain going on to guarding, muscle spasms and inflammation, and restricted mobility. Patients then develop muscle weakness, loss of normal function, get upset, angry, frustrated, feel helpless, and it's a vicious cycle of pain. The Cognitive Behavioural Programme would also help improve sleep hygiene, interpersonal relationship and strategies to improve self-confidence, self-efficacy, change the locus of control um, from external to internal, reduce pain catastrophizing, reinforce and maintain the gains that have been made through this CBT programme and breaking the pain cycle and in awareness of their pain cycle and prevent relapses. There's also a role towards providing social support if needed to complete the provision of care. The educational components of a CBT program go into the neurobiology of pain and its consequences, discussing acute versus chronic stress and how it relates to pain, the consequences of medication and opioid use, the consequences of physical deconditioning, consequences of limited function. All of these aspects are discussed in detail with the patient. Bear in mind, the aim is to assess the, the knowledge of their patient, teach new knowledge, help them acquire new skills, put those skills into practice and rehearse them and reinforce and provide feedback, which then reinforces these skills again, go back and reassess the knowledge that is gained. This little cartoon depicts exactly what uh, we work on. The cycle of education in CBT programs forms the crux of it and you assess their knowledge as we discussed and take them through the cycle, reinforcing and helping them reevaluate it at regular intervals, helping the change happen. Turk and Okifuji suggested these six stages, uh, assessment, reconceptualization, skills acquisition and consolidation, rehearsal and application, generalization and maintenance and follow up. So when we talk about psychometric tests or other useful tests and questionnaires, uh, there are a whole range of tests that can be used to not only evaluate patients prior to a pain cognitive behavioral program, uh, but also to monitor progress through the program and follow up uh, ch changes that have happened in the patient along with outcome measures. Some of the tests to measure depression are the HADS and BDI, which is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Score, and the Beck Depression Inventory Score. We use uh, coping strategies questionnaires and the coping pain coping inventory scales, which are quite useful in managing in evaluating coping skills. We also use confidence assessments and the PSEQ and the ASEQ, which are patient self-efficacy questionnaires and arthritis self-efficacy questionnaires which are very specific for arthritis patients are beneficial in these. For pain and daily activity the brief pain inventory is quite useful SF36, the short form 36 and the middle pain questionnaire may be used. 
Bear in mind, we have put up a little table which shows you the positive coping strategies, which include diversion, reinterpretation, self-talk or coping self-statements, deny or ignore the pain, and increased levels of activity. On the negative side, negative coping strategies are pain catastrophization, praying or hoping, and increasing pain behavior. So we're trying to actually make that change happen. Several psychometric tests that are available, including the PSOCQ, which is a patient stages of change questionnaire, which we've put down here on the side and has four different stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, and maintenance. And what it does is uh, describes the change that patients make through the process of a program. Patients are evaluated before the program and you understand where they lie in the stage of change they are monitored through the program and after the program trying to show the changes that have happened. Also use the SCL90R, PBPI and the PLCS which are other tests. Details of all of these tests are available along with the notes and it gives you brief pointers on how these scoring systems uh, measure and what aspects they measure and how it is useful in CBT programs. So what are the benefits of pain management programs? Um, the pain management programs offer patients solutions to specific issues and problems. There's a reduction in disability, there's increased independence despite being in pain, there's a reduction in distress, and there's a willingness to tolerate complications. We make positive shifts in patients who attend these programs, there's improved confidence levels as a consequence of that, and there's better management of daily activities and, and medication. And these may be looked at through self-efficacy questionnaires or confidence level questionnaires. So where does the future of CBT lie or pain management programs lie in the context of chronic pain? Uh, there's a role for community-based cognitive behavioral therapy programs or pain management programs. And these could be patient or clin patient-centered clinician-led seamless integrated services. This may lead to the patient attending the program in the community where they gain a variety of um, input, including social support services to help with their overall functionality. Internet-based CBT approaches are also gaining popularity. Certain institu institutes in Europe are using it and it's promising for people in pain. It's useful for patients who can access the internet and are motivated enough to run through a program without supervision or minimal supervision. There's been some interest especially using mindfulness based strategies and techniques through a CBT approach and the ACT therapy acceptance and commitment therapies in patients uh, through internet based programs. So to summarize we spoke about the origin of cognitive behavioral therapy. We spoke about some of the pioneers in the field and their contributions. We discussed what is CBT and what does it aim to achieve? Who is it for and who not? We've discussed the role of the cognitive behavioral therapist and the team that works together to deliver this program. We've spoken about the relevant tests that may be used and the future and benefits of a cognitive behavioral program. That ends the talk on cognitive behavioral therapy and pain management programs. Thank you.